What an intro. What an intro. I'm going to test with you at the end if this lives up to uh, my very fabulous uh, introduction. Thank you so much, Ollie Barrett. So, um, Ollie uh, very kindly gave a, a rundown of my bio. I spent a decade in the UK government running some of the digital change programmes. I had the great pleasure to be the first comms director of DirectGov, the first head of social media for the UK government, joining up 32 central government departments. And we think the first head of social media for any government in the world. So most of the work that I've been doing, there's been no rule book for, um, and we've had to uh, find policy and processes and ways of doing things where there's really been no precedent before. In the digital change programs, both in government and uh, in my uh, career in Transmute, really, looking at digital change within uh, large national businesses, global businesses, and international governments, is actually less the work that I do as a strategist in terms of the tools and technology, but it's more to do with actually the people and the culture of how can you get cultural change to, to stick and how can you embed better digital practices um, with the people that you have in them. So I have got the challenge of condensing sort of 15 years into the next 20 minutes with you, and I've got 10 lessons, 10 lessons that we found uh, are true that I'm going to share with you now. You need to innovate now. It's intimidating, isn't it? You know, you don't go up to a comedian and say, be funny. But essentially, uh, people in organisations are asked all the time to innovate. Now, can I just have a show of hands? And I won't ask you to do this, I promise. Who can juggle three balls? Okay, a few of you, okay. For those that can juggle three balls, can you also juggle five? Okay, it's a bit, bit trickier, a bit trickier. This is an analogy from MIT, and they teach it in their, in their uh, training and learning programs online. But essentially, you need a map. You need a map of where those balls are in the air and where they're going to fall. You need to be able to think um, through a, a process. And, and so often we see in large businesses particularly, and we're looking here at what's happening in large businesses and government and what we can learn from it ourselves in smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses, or... For the agencies in the room, what are the things that we can do to help our clients? You need a map and you need processes. Now, most organisations will start with product innovation. How can we make the things that we make smarter, faster, a little bit differently? But actually, where you really should start is defining your culture of innovation first. So um, we have Facebook's mantra from you here, move fast and break things. It's perfectly fit for Facebook. It's not going to work in Sotheby's. It's not going to work in Christie's. <laughs> they don't want to move things. <laughs> they don't want to move fast and break things. So you have to define what is right and appropriate from your culture. Um, at least a decade or so ago, the Abbey National had a strapline, a customer-facing strapline, because life's complicated enough. I'm sure some of you can remember that. And essentially what they did is they took their entire middle management through a program of simplification. It's a very simple mantra, uh, but living and breathing that innovation both internally in the business. And at the time, it made them uh, a strong enough brand that Lloyds couldn't take over um, at the time. So it doesn't have to be shiny and new in terms of your ethos, but it does have to be true uh, particularly to your culture and your industry. I work with a couple of um, global law firms. They don't want to move fast and break things. Neither do the investment fund managers I work with. So, so define your culture of innovation. The next is looking at your innovation program. Microsoft uh, have sort of three pillars to their innovation program. So they look at what can they do to the products, what can they do to the processes, and what can they do to the policy. And, and essentially, that's great, and that will sit a lot in the kind of processes and systems that they tool, and the tools that they use for it. But essentially, going back to the behaviours, it's one of the most difficult, difficult things in a business to get right. Because you can't say to someone, you, you're not behaving in this new appropriate way that we've set up for you as a business. And there's a very sensitive issue about behaviour, um, uh, the types of behaviours you want your company to adopt and adapt. And we'll come through some, some uh, processes for that. What about the environment? So that doesn't have to be a new, shiny building. It might be the way in which you use your existing premises. And I've got a couple of examples um, that I'll run through in this presentation. A lot about the processes and systems. So what are the ways in which that you can share information? What is the way that you can build an idea? And what are the tools internally that enable you to be able to do that? But also, more importantly, it's the communication, and not at the end, and not broadcast, but all the way through um, a program of change, to be able to not just tell people, but really, really check that they've understood, um, and to be able to have that uh, really open communication around it. 
So you need to define before you start your programme what you're going to tackle, in what order, and with what financial capital. As I said, most people will start with the product innovation, a bit about process and policy in innovation. If you have the luxury of all the time and budget in the world, you'd like to tackle all of these five things, but you might just start um, uh, and test and scale and innovate, as we've heard in a lot of the presentations uh, today, of what you're going to be able to pick up. So this is a very simple model, and some of you uh, may be very familiar with it, but um, it's incredibly powerful. To give it its um, full name, it is Prochesca and Di Clemente's Transtheoretical Behaviour Change Model. Because <laughs> everything in Cabinet Office had to be rooted in behaviour science and in doctrine. But actually, we use this in the Department for Energy and Climate Change to get people to turn off their taps when they were cleaning their teeth and to fill up their kettle less to save water. So you can use it for marketing communications as well. But imagine it's for an innovation programme. If people in your business are in pre-contemplation, they don't like your program, they've not heard of your program, they're afraid of the change that's going to happen, as many people in businesses are. So you need a set of um, processes to be able to either raise awareness, understand the, the uh, disengagement and combat it, and increase the relevance to the people to move them to at least contemplation. They've heard of your innovation program internally in your business now. Uh, but essentially, they're not bought into it yet. So there's different policies and processes. You need to provide solutions to be able to get them bought into your particular program. And different people have different triggers. And it might be about reassurance and change. It might be uh, looking at different aspects of that. If they're prepared, then they're bought into your program. But there's not been that pressure of a deadline. And they haven't taken the action, whatever that action might be. It might be around to put your hand up for being an innovation advocate. It might be to be able to communicate to your team. Or it might be to um, you know, contribute to a process of innovation internally in the business, whatever that action um, is. So people are prepared for action. There's no pressing deadline. So you need to facilitate that action to make it as slippy as you possibly can to be able to make no barriers to people who are prepared for to um, create the action that you're intending. And obviously when they've take, taken that, you need to reinforce it, you need to maintain it, generate um, advocacy around it or potentially peer feedback. So it's an interesting model. It is around behavior change and it has been used to good effect, um, not just with innovation programming, but in any other communication program. For those of us who work in agencies um, who are helping our clients with those needs, the, you know, people say, oh, we want, uh, we want awareness and we want sales. Well, they're two different actions. There's two different budgets <laughs> around that for you, um, good people. It's intrinsic that there's great leadership behind a change of innovation program. But more than that, we want infectious leadership. We want a CEO and a visionary so strong that we can all get behind when programs have made enormous, um, <coughs> enormous change and, and fast change. It's because of the purpose. Um, it was mentioned earlier um, in some of the talks today that people can get behind the reason for a company is more than profits, it's a purpose. Um, uh, there's a fab friend of ours, uh, Jeremy Waite, who's written a book, Significant Brands, about people aligning themselves with brands that uh, you know, have a real purpose behind them that people can get, um, get behind. But essentially, in larger organisations, it's very generally the, the senior management here that can become blockers to innovation programme because they're not walking the talk. They are the, the people most in a business most, most likely to not uh, take on board the you know, behaviours and the attributes of the programme. And that can be difficult. Um, uh, we found uh, within government, sometimes it's the middle managers who are the blocker, who say, I love that innovation programme, I'm bought into it. Just not here, not, not in my office. Um, uh, or I'm an exception to the rule, not here. And you need to find strategies and processes around that. So if you are running these programmes, lead from wherever you are. You have the opportunity um, not uh, to um, uh, combat the disengagement within businesses and, and lead from the middle of the pack if that is your remit uh, to be able to do so. Many organisations I've worked with, there are no business objectives, there are no business plan, even in big brands and in, in global businesses, which I'm constantly surprised by. And you have the opportunity that without that structure, to formulate that structure, to suggest the innovation programme um, to be able to move forward. So in the absence of strong direction, you all have the opportunity to make that change happen um, and to leave from within. 
you absolutely have to value your people. And it was great to be able to um, hear that. We're not talking about employee of the month, Hakeem. We're not talking about innovator of the month either. This is about really understanding what makes employee loyalty. So if you take the uh, Sunday Times best places to work list and you tear it apart and do some analytics, which we do every year, there's three uh, reasons that kind of underpin uh, people and company loyalty. So they are being invested in their personal development rather than their professional development. Uh, companies that breed loyalty are teaching people sushi making and scuba diving and nothing to do with their personal development plan, but they're teaching them how to learn. Because we are in a, in a society of such fast digital change that we have to prepare our people to navigate a career path that doesn't yet exist. Our people are likely to be doing jobs in five years' time that haven't been created yet. And with that in mind, you want to create a thirst for learning. You want to create an environment where people are capable of taking new principles and practices and applying them. And uh, one of the ways that you can do that is investing in other skills and making people feel uh, loved and part of your environment. A team we heard earlier, not a family, which I really loved uh, the analogy of. The other two attributes of um, building loyalty within a company are if you've got a company of a sizable enough uh, organisation to have a competitive sports endeavour, whether you like that yourself or not. Apparently, it's very bonding for organisations. And the third thing is to contribute to a charity in more than fiscal means. So the company supports a charity and people go and volunteer and work with people perhaps less fortunate themselves and see the real difference that they made to those people's lives is incredibly um, bonding uh, for employees in a, in a company context. So those are the three pillars, investment in skills, competitive sports if it's your thing, um, and also a contribution to a charity, embeds loyalty. You have to um, nurture really good ideas. It was lovely to hear unicorns uh, touted earlier in the uh, presentations too. But actually what we're talking about here is really, it's not just good enough to say to people, oh, that was a great idea. People want to know if they've taken the time and trouble to contribute to one of your initiatives, what happens with that information? If it didn't go forward, why not? Um, and to have really the processes and systems to develop the ideas, to generate and iterate them. It may be an idea that provided a platform for many other people's ideas that were taken for fruition. But if you're not communicating that back to the business, you're going to suffer from uh, innovation ennui, where people, why should they contribute if they don't know what's happening um, with their ideas? You have to build an environment where it's okay to uh, fail but not, we're not talking about failing forward, failing fast, or any of those other kind of buzzwords, where it's okay to try things and it doesn't turn out to the successful conclusion. You have to build an environment where people aren't scared to try new things. And it's a very difficult thing to be able to do. Um, the uh, classic mantra of uh, someone from IT turning up because you broke something, um, and making that into, come on, let's all create things and, and get excited together. Um, it's okay to, to fail, of course, but it's looking at how we can learn from all of those. There's, um, there's a great example, and I'm going to use it um, a few times within this presentation, that UK TV are doing some really interesting uh, work in terms of their growth and their market share, and they've put a couple of things in. I don't work with them, I'm just declaring they've done some really interesting things. So um, uh, there was a project manager who could see a program that she had initiated uh, was not going to work out to the best effect. And it's actually quite a brave individual that says to her seniors and betters, no, this is going to, what, what's happened today has cost us money. But actually, what I do believe is we need to stop this now and we need to re-engineer it and look at how we could perhaps do this better. Um, and it's a, a painful and embarrassing thing, and, and more so in the UK than, uh, than other countries and how they uh, adopt to stop and relearn from it. And it ended up saving the company uh, a lot more money and a better process was put in place. But it was only enabled because the culture supports this level of um, interaction to be able to say... We, um, we, need to, we need to stop and relook at this. You need to consider the environment. And again, it's um, one of the themes that was uh, brought up earlier today. So this is a shot I took on my, um, my iPhone, uh, BBC Media City in Manchester. We don't all have the luxury of being able to have hooded seats that have um, soft furnishings so people can have private conversations in open spaces, okay? It's not about sexy furniture. If you're an agency, it's not to do with ball pools and pubs in your agency. It's actually, uh, you can work in the space that you have just a little bit differently. So one of the things that the BBC did was co-locate their editorial teams amongst their digital teams so that they could have a better 
understanding of how they could work together in terms of working processes. The UK TV took that one step further. So they have a program of quarterly rotational seating. So it's not hot desking, because everyone knows you'll choose a hot desk and you'll go back to that desk time and time again because you feel comfortable there, right? It's quarterly rotational seating at 3 p.m. on a Friday, four times a year, you're given a new allocated seat. You pick up um, your machine in your bag and you move to that seat. You're not sat within your team, but you're sat near enough to your other individuals also spread out in the building of your team that you can communicate effectively. But you're embedded in another part of the business entirely. So four times a year, you get a really deep, rich and important experience about what the other people around you within the business do. They also um, have um, all company team meetings where they set the objectives and then it's up to the teams to be able to work through the, object, uh, the implementation plan for those. And the Ministry of Justice, again, have all stand-up meetings where there are 400 people or so in a room in an all-team stand-up meeting to be able to you know, communicate um, key uh, information at the start of um, particular projects. So redesigning the environment isn't around building new um, uh, premises, but it is about using the space that you have effectively so that better communication um, can be enabled within your business. You need clear processes, systems, and tools uh, to be able to uh, look at effective innovation programs. And we had um, we had some uh, you know chat earlier about Slack and other um, processes internally where people can kind of share ideas. And they're, they're not they're not necessarily new, but um, you have to communicate the expectation of what you want people to be able to do, as well as the processes and systems be uh, clear and easy to use. So there's two examples I want to give you. There's been a lot of focus on kind of digital and technology today, even though even though uh, we're talking about innovation. So there's a there's an innovation uh, process that I absolutely have nothing to do with technology. In fact, hampered by technology, the National Trust, in one of their large um, visitor footfall um, uh, attractions uh, are hampered by the technology that they can't get broadband and they can't get Wi-Fi because of the way in which um, uh, the area is located, there's not great signal, um, there's not the infrastructure to get the pipes to them. So it's very frustrating when you need to run you know, 200,000 visitors a year or come to one of their sites and you have to get information from the ranger to the visitor, experience managers to the marketing teams around. They use the cauldron in reception where they write ideas um, that are happening live all around the building and all around uh, the parks and lands and put them in the cauldron so the social media manager can go to one place offline where technology um, isn't needed and grab those ideas and look at what are the information that they're going to share. And, and, it's, and it's sweet and I love it. But it works for them. It does not necessarily about the technology, they've worked a process where they can get rapid communication from you know, 200 people across an estate in, into one place. So consider in your processes and systems that it doesn't have to be the shiniest new tool. Um, the second uh, is a process that I love. So there's a fantastic book. I haven't got the slides like uh, lots of other speakers have today in terms of the book. It's Daniel Kahneman, and it's Fast and Slow Thinking. He's won the Nobel Prize for how our brain works. He's a behavioral scientist. And, um, and, uh, and in Daniel's book, um, it is, they've taken this idea in UK TV and they, they've plugged it into their work, and they call it the pre-mortem. So we're used to post-mortems. We're used to perhaps running a TV show and at the end of that unpacking, what went well? What, what didn't go well? What can we learn from this and put into the process for the next time um, we run a show similar to this? No, they do a pre-mortem. They look at every single thing that could go wrong with a show before it launches. And they sit down and they unpack it and they put in place all the processes and systems so the thing that's going to make the show wrong doesn't happen before they run it and they evaluate at the end. And I wanted to share it with you. I thought it was um, a neat process in principle. So it's not necessarily all about the technology and the systems. It is about looking at um, what are the systems and processes that work for you to achieve your objective in your particular part of your innovation plan or campaign. Just get on with it. <laughs> the GDS, uh, the Government Digital Service, have a great principle, which is um, when defining kind of digital transformation. For them, they say, service is so good, people prefer to use them. So uh, a team set up the uh, 15 exemplar services, digital services, that uh, they want to change to make people better for you know, government online services and transactions. And some of the old guards said, 
What is the um, what is the government's benefit realisation offer to departments? So we haven't got one. We are just changing these fifteen digital services uh, to make it better. So plan, yes, but do have an unwavering focus on delivery. And as we heard earlier today, those uh, those quick wins. Um, the, what are you going to do within 100 days to prove that your, your uh, program is working and that you can um, uh, move forward to the next step with more gain trust? And, and the last thing I'll mention is about the communication, really. So you need to be able to share at every stage what's working, how and why, and how that can be applied. And it's not broadcast, and it's not at the end of your program, it's all the way through. I mentioned this earlier, and it's worth uh, uh, leaving on just this. Not about telling people things, but really understanding um, what's been understood from your program to be able to move forward. That's everything I want to share with you in a top 20 uh, minutes, just 20 minutes and a few seconds over. So thank you so much for uh, listening. It's been lovely to put this together for you today and for Like Minds. It's great to be back here. Thank you.